Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for today's virtual media briefing about COVID-19 in London and Middlesex County. We are glad to have you along with us. Also happy to be joined this afternoon by the Mayor of London, Ed Holder, and the Medical Officer of Health at the Middlesex London Health Unit, Dr. Chris Mackey. A welcome to members of the media in attendance this afternoon and for those who are returning and have been with us before and for those who may be new, just a reminder that when you do have questions, click on the text bubble with the question mark here on Microsoft Teams. And if you could, when you submit your question, indicate your name as well as your media outlet and who your question is for. Finally, a welcome to those joining us on Rogers Television as well as the Rogers Facebook page and YouTube channel. Listeners on Global News Radio 980 CFPL and those who are joining us on the CTV London website. Let's get to the opening remarks right away. and We'll start with Mayor Ed Holder. Mayor Holder. Thanks, uh, Dan, and good afternoon, everyone. So we've had back-to-back -back, uh, days now of case counts in the mid-30s. While it's not necessarily time to press the panic button, it certainly causes concern. At the same time, I take some measure of comfort knowing our vaccination rates continue to climb with more people, and especially younger people, rolling up their sleeves on a daily basis. When I look at the overall numbers as of just a couple of days ago, London Middlesex had pulled ahead of the provincial average for first shots administered to the 12 and older population. We're at just under 85%, 84.7% to be exact. And we're now at the provincial average on second shots, 78.4. Let me also thank those who remain active involved in our vaccination efforts through any number of ways. And that includes staffing our mobile clinics at White Oaks Mall, which opened earlier this week. We saw great turnouts uh, at a similar clinic at Masonville Place earlier this month. And we're hoping that success to continue one vaccination at a time. Beyond that, and unrelated to the pandemic, I'd like to give a, a, a strong acknowledgement and shout out to those from Fanshawe and Western, in particular for speaking up and taking a stand against gender-based violence. I know the London Police Service continues to actively investigate recent allegations. It's absolutely critical we allow that investigation to proceed. Regardless of the outcome, however, we know that gender-based violence exists. And we also know, or at least we should know, that every single one of us has a role to play in its eradication. The City of London, for example, is an active participant in Safe Cities London, the United Nations initiative, which is aimed at addressing sexual violence that occurs in public spaces. We're also fortunate in London have such a range of compassionate staff and volunteers at a number of support organizations. That includes ANOVA, the London Abused Women's Center, and at LOSA along with case managers, uh, both at Fanshawe and Western. Ultimately, however, as I mentioned, we all have a role to play. Everyone can make a difference and everyone can look out and stand up for one another. In part, it's how we act, how we behave, but it's also what we say and, and sometimes what we don't. Um, I noticed just very uh, recently in, in media that there are signs that are being put on uh, Western's uh, windows and doors and it says, see something, do something. Again, it's been a traumatic week for too many. Never mind as a father or as a husband or brother. As a human being, my heart breaks for those who have suffered. Aside from supporting those who have been subjected to gender-based violence, we owe it to survivors to ensure it doesn't happen again. Over to you, Dr. Magnin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. As usual, you've hit some very important points. I appreciate you identifying uh, this region pulling ahead of the provincial average in terms of vaccination rates. If you look at how the province calculates those rates, we're actually even further ahead at 87% first doses and 80% second doses uh, just reached this week. And absolutely appropriate, I believe, to bring the uh, issues happening in association with gender-based violence around uh, students and young people in our community into the conversation around COVID. We are seeing um, we are seeing a lot of people reacting in ways that have caused harm uh, related to the pandemic, whether it's the stress of lockdown or whatever the case. Certainly, there are no excuses here. And you know, I, I think there was a, a first-hand account shared on social media this morning of a sophomore supervisor who had been part of uh, orientation week activities 
very disturbing to hear uh, firsthand from her what she witnessed. On the COVID front, we do have some important developments. The uh, federal government has now indicated and Ontario is aligned that in spite of some vaccines that are used overseas being approved by the World Health Organization, they won't be considered adequate in terms of the vaccine certificate system that Ontario is implementing. The two vaccines that come out of, uh, out of China are the Sinopharm and the Sinovac vaccine. At this point, Health Canada and the Ontario government are not considering those doses of two doses of Sinopharm Sinovac to be adequate and uh, to be considered uh, immune under the vaccine certificate system. That will mean that people who have had those vaccines and have not had an additional dose of, of either AstraZeneca or one of the mRNA vaccines, Pfizer or Moderna, will need a third dose of one of those vaccines. We've had a number of people come forward with, with this question and up until now, the uh, provincial federal government have considered you know, the WHO approved vaccines to be adequate. At this point, that is changing. And so, you know, a number of people have actually come through our clinic, lots of students or international travelers saying they've had two doses of Sinopharm or Sinovac and being told you don't need an additional dose. And, and that advice is changing now. So those folks uh, do need a, a third dose of uh, ideally one of the mRNA vaccines that are available in any of our clinics. We have a had a bit of an issue arise with an, a religious exemption form that the health unit had been using for staff uh, because it was publicly available. We made it available for uh, businesses in case they wanted to use it. Uh, it's actually been abused. It's been used to, uh, in uh, other jurisdictions as a form that should justify a religious exemption to vaccination. That's not the purpose of the form. It was really an internal form uh, to flag for our HR team that there was a need to have a conversation with the individual. So even within the health unit, filling out the form wasn't an automatic religious exemption. If I, it, it, what it did was trigger a conversation so that that can be worked through with, with the, between the individual and the organization. Uh, others have used it elsewhere to say, look, I've got this completed form, therefore I'm exempt from vaccine passports or certificates. That's not the intention. And, and we've taken that form off the website uh, in order to clarify that. Uh, a bit of good news, we had tremendous showing yesterday at the White Oaks Mobile Clinic and 266 vaccines given. We almost ran out of vaccine yesterday. There were just, you know, there was just one vial left with six doses in it at the end of that day yesterday with the White Oaks Clinic at 7 p.m. when that clinic was winding down. So tremendous turnout by the White Oaks community and uh, folks using the White Oaks Mall. Once again, thanks so much to White Oaks Mall for uh, per, per partnering with the health unit to offer that clinic. And uh, we've, we've sent them more doses than previous days today and uh, hope to see that demand continue and uh, we'll continue to be ready. Uh, big thanks to everyone who continues to roll up their sleeve. In order to highlight for you the shift towards mobile vaccine, I'm going to share our daily update uh, bulletin uh, that uh, that we have shared on this call a number of times before. Uh, is that coming through, Dan? Yes, it is, Dr. Mackey. We can see it. Great. So this is the dashboard of vaccines that have come through uh, the health unit or the partners working directly with the health unit, such as London Health Science Center at the Agriplex or Middlesex London Paramedic Services. And you can see that uh, you know, cumulative doses, the difference between this and what is reported on our website is essentially pharmacy doses. So there are well over 100,000 doses that have been administered in pharmacies and big kudos to the pharmacies there. Most of the rest, almost all the rest of the vaccines are, are through this uh, dashboard. The total doses administered yesterday were 770, 766. The Mount Bridges Clinic, Agriplex is closed Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Mount Bridges is open on those days. The Mount Bridges Clinic saw just 91 people attend the clinic yesterday. Our mobile teams, and we had, uh, I believe, three in the field, 
had 532 doses administered. So the large bulk of those 766 that were administered yesterday, including, as I mentioned, 266 at White Elks Mall. 143 other community partner vaccinations. That would include primary care and Middlesex Line and Paramedic Services. So you can see that mobile is, is what's happening now, right now. That is really where uh, people are attending to get the bulk of vaccines uh, these days. Then I will pause there. Look forward to any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Mackey. And uh, we do have quite a few questions, so let's get to those right away. And uh, I, in looking through the questions, uh, I noticed that there's some breaking news that's been happening in the last couple of hours around Health Canada's decision to shift from the uh, company names for vaccines to the trade names. So, uh, Dr. Mackey, there are a couple of questions about that that we'll be getting to shortly. All right, the first question this afternoon comes from Jane Sims at the London Free Press. Dr. Mackey, it's been two weeks since the health unit advised local businesses that they should have their own double vaccination policies. Since that announcement, how many businesses have reached out to the health unit for guidance? Do you expect there will be widespread policies to match the province's vaccine certification program starting next week? Jane, I don't, uh, a number of businesses have reached out. I don't have a count for you at the moment. One of the main routes is that we will be sharing, uh, co-hosting a webinar with the London Chamber of Commerce as of uh, next week. And so that, that's where I think we'll have a lot of the engagement with businesses. And uh, we can certainly update you after that around uh, the attendance there. Thank you very much. Let's go to the next question. And it's a follow up from Jane Sims. Uh, Dr. Mackey, here we go. Health Canada announced it will be using the new trade names for the Pfizer, Moderna, and AstraZeneca vaccines, now to be called, and I, and I practice this a little bit, Comirnaty, Spikevax, and Vaxzevria. Will the health unit be using those names as well? You know, I, I appreciate the question, Jane. I, I don't think we've had, put a lot of thought into that. I, you know, we want to use terms that people will recognize and understand. Uh, so certainly we'll we'll look at that, but uh, the name of the vaccine is not the primary concern for us. It's really the safety and effectiveness, and we have uh, two excellent mRNA vaccines and a strong AstraZeneca vaccine as well. Dr. Mackey, I am going to skip ahead on a couple of questions just to uh, take care of all of the trade name questions at the same time. Uh, Jacqueline LaBelle at Global News Radio 980 CFPL has a related question. Uh, Dr. Mackey, is the health unit worried at all about any potential confusion caused by these new vaccine names? If so, will the health unit do anything to help combat that confusion? Yeah, I mean, this is really a, a branding and marketing uh, issue. It's something that the uh, vaccine manufacturers feel is important. From my perspective, you know, it's not really where we put a lot of our attention, but certainly if anybody has questions or uncertainty, we'll use whatever name makes uh, sense and, and whatever name they understand. Thank you, Dr. Mackey. And if you'll permit me, there is one more here uh, from Christy Lee Varley, uh, who I believe is joining us for the first time from CTV London today. Uh, so we've talked about the, the trade names. Dr. Mackey, do you think this move was necessary on the part of the Public Health Agency of Canada? And do you think it will be confusing to people who are perhaps considering the vaccine or when people go for their booster shot. Again, I appreciate the question. We're not the experts on branding or labeling. Uh, we will continue to communicate however people are best going to understand. All right, thank you very much. I think that does take care of those questions. So let's move on to the next one. It comes from Jennifer Beeman at the London Free Press. Uh, Jennifer asked, Dr. Mackey, should Ontario take any lessons from Alberta, which has had to change course of action uh, and immediately implement strict restrictions? Well, I think Ontario has very much taken lessons from Alberta. You know, a month or so ago, you were hearing talk about reopening fully, moving past step three. And, um, you know, many were asking, shouldn't we be more like Ontario? Sorry, shouldn't Ontario be more like Alberta? 
I think the case counts and decimation of the hospital system in, in Alberta have answered that question. And it's clear that the provincial government has uh, has taken many lessons and uh, you know we don't hear any discussion about further reopening at this point which clearly is the right thing in terms of controlling COVID. And a follow-up question from Jennifer Beeman. Uh, Dr. Mackey, should more moderate restrictions be put in place now to help mitigate the fourth wave instead of more harsh restrictions later on? You know, the important step that is happening right now is around mandatory vaccination policy. That will create a much higher degree of safety in many indoor environments where we know vaccine virus can spread easily. We are certainly looking at some of those, you know, party environments that we're currently seeing reports of young people gathering in close proximity. These are, are places where you know, absolutely what can be done should be done and also there are limits on what can be done for various reasons. The There aren't a lot of other high risk environments that are really coming out in terms of our data right now. We're not seeing significant outbreaks uh, in workplaces that have high vaccination rates. Uh, cases are not spread, case, cases are occurring among primarily unvaccinated, they're not spreading far. Uh, so that's fairly reassuring. And there's actually a plateau in the data provincially and locally where you're seeing the case counts flatten very much, at, which again is likely related to high vaccination coverage, as well as some naturally acquired immunity among the unvaccinated as they get infected with COVID. So, you know, we're looking at that. There are additional measures being play, put in place, especially around vaccine policy. They all will make a difference. And uh, hopefully we can avoid a really significant wave uh, this fall. Thank you very much. And a final question from Jennifer Beeman for you, Dr. Mackey. Uh, how is the health unit's third dose rollout going, especially in long-term care? Do we know how many people have received a third shot? Yeah, so that is ongoing, uh, Jennifer. We're not reporting back third doses uh, separately at this point, but as that campaign continues, that certainly will be the case. Almost all of the long-term care facilities in our area have been able to come on board with the COVAX vaccine tracking system and are able to vaccinate their own staff, you know, with some logistics support, primarily around supplies from the health unit. So. That's a huge shift. Huge thanks to everyone in long-term care who was, um, who has been working to uh, make sure that they have that capacity in-house. Thank you very much. Next question comes to us from Kirat Walia at the Western Gazette. Uh, Mayor Holder, this is a question for you, and it does relate to something uh, you mentioned in your opening remarks. Uh, Kirat is asking, Mayor Holder, will you be attending the walkout on Western campus tomorrow? Well, Kurt, thank you for that uh, question. Uh, tomorrow, uh, actually, I'll be away at a family funeral. But uh, frankly, if I could be, could have been there, I absolutely would have. I, this also gives me a chance to acknowledge and commend the organizers uh, of this event. I gather all student-based and student-prompted, and I think that's so important. And look, I truly hope it will help in changing culture and the healing process. So while I can't attend, I look forward to helping in any way absolutely that I could going forward. Thank you very much, Mayor Holder. Jane Sims has another question for Dr. Mackey. Uh, Dr. Mackey, this relates to uh, your opening remarks about full vaccination. Uh, Dr. Mackey, how many people in our region would have taken the Sinopharm or Sinovac vaccine? Yeah, thanks for the question, Jane. I know people pre-submit a lot of questions, so I always appreciate any that do relate to the opening marks. Um, the, you know, our estimates would be that they're, you know, it's in the hundreds. We don't have exact data. Uh, many of those people have come to the health unit or submitted through our online portal uh, their evidence of vaccination so that they can be tracked through the COVAX system. Um, the but we don't have an exact number and that that hasn't been mandatory to this point. So there certainly are those that are that are out there that haven't done it. Uh, normally you have, you know, thousands and thousands of international students traveling to London and Middlesex, primarily London, 
uh, to attend Fanshawe, Western, and other uh, post-secondary and, and actually secondary schools in the area. That obviously has been significantly curbed in the face of the pandemic. You really aren't seeing those large numbers. So it, it isn't the, the number that we would uh, previously have expected. Uh, and again, ample capacity in the mobile and the mass vaccination centers to support those that uh, need that third dose. Thank you very much. Let's go to our next question. Sophia Rodriguez uh, has the next question from CBC London. Uh, and Sophia, I, I I saw your question and I actually went to our dashboard uh, to take a look at the most updated numbers today. Um, your question says we've now seen over 20 cases reported at local schools. Uh, that number is actually uh, 14. Uh, there are 14 cases that are associated with schools, one associated with the child care. And again, those are located on the COVID-19 dashboard at healthunit.com. So if you'll permit, I'll change the number here. Uh, we've now seen 14 cases reported at local schools. Have any of the most recent cases been traced back to a single classroom? The lowest vaccination rate is among those 18 to 24. The health unit has made an effort to target that demographic with pop-up clinics downtown. What more can you do to get those people to get their shots? Yeah, thank you for the question, Sophia. So those cases haven't been traced back to the classroom. And uh, you know, you'll know when that happens because that'll be when we declare an outbreak. At this point, we don't have any outbreaks in uh, in schools. So it's transmission within the classroom that we look for around that declaration of an outbreak. And uh, we haven't seen that at this point. But again, it is early to be able to detect that uh, simply because of the time that it takes for symptoms to show up and test results to come back. So yes, lowest, so separately, now we're transitioning into the, the post-secondary sort of age. 18 to 24 vaccination rates is uh, is is lower. The doses till dark that we're doing on Richmond has been a huge boom to that population. We're seeing a lot of the young folks attend for doses there. We're actually getting a lot of that crowd in the malls as well. The, the experience at, at, at Masonville last week, uh, last two weeks, I guess, when we vaccinated about 2,500 people in a 14 day period in Masonville Mall is that the majority, about 60% of those folks who uh, who got vaccinated in the mall were under age 30. So really exactly the demographic that we're talking about here. And, uh, and I mean, the, the malls have been tremendous supports. Huge uh, thanks again to Masonville and to White Oaks. And we look forward to continuing our partnership. Uh, Jane Sims is back with another question, Dr. Mackey, and again, this relates to something you brought up in your opening remarks. Uh, Jane asked, Dr. Mackey, what is the criteria for a medical exemption from a vaccine in Ontario? Yeah, there really are not a lot of medical exemptions that are, are deemed to be required. At, at this point, the medical exemptions are primarily around allergic reactions. So if somebody has a documented, you know, physician uh, a physician diagnosed allergy to one of the components of the vaccine, they, you know, they may be able to actually still get vaccinated under the supervision of an allergist. Uh, we do have an allergist at St. Joe's that offers that. However, that would potentially be considered a legitimate medical exemption. The other exemption is around, again, severe physician diagnosed documented reactions to a single dose. If somebody has a, a very severe reaction to their first dose uh, that potentially could be life-threatening, then that obviously becomes a medical exemption to getting the second dose. And a related question from Jacqueline LaBelle at Global News Radio, Dr. Mackey. Uh, in regards to the religious exemption form you mentioned in your opening remarks, how many people accessed it this month before it was taken down from the health unit's website? Yeah, thanks for the question, Jacqueline. I don't have the, the count. Um, we, we don't necessarily track uh, how many folks have clicked on that link. And uh, just a, a word uh, to our media members who are joining us on the call. If you do have a question you haven't yet submitted, uh, now would be the time. We're down to the end. So once again, if you do have a question, click on the text bubble with the question mark in it here on Microsoft Teams and we'll get to that 
question hopefully uh, before the end of today's briefing. Jennifer Beeman is uh, back with another question from the Free Press, Dr. Mackey. About that plateau, what's happening here? Is it still too early to see any return to school related surges? Yeah, and appreciate the question. So Jennifer, the, the question about why are we plateauing provincially and locally? The, the most reasonable explanation is around the high vaccination rates. Again, you've got a little bit of naturally acquired immunity in people who are unvaccinated as they acquire COVID. It is a bit early to see significant spread related to return to school. There's also a lot of safety in the school system, particularly around masking and the extension of masking to the younger age groups. That really does help control the spread in indoor environments. And the, but you know, it, it's, it looks to be primarily related to uh, high and climbing vaccination rates that are really highest in, in the world at this point. Thank you very much, Dr. Mackey. And that does bring us to the end of our questions for this afternoon's virtual media briefing. I'd like to thank you very much for joining us. And also thank you, Dr. Mackey, Mayor Holder, for your information, your insights and your comments as always. We will be back with our next virtual media briefing on Monday, the 20th of September at 2 p.m. We hope you'll be able to join us then. So between now and next Monday, have a great rest of your Thursday afternoon. Have a wonderful weekend and so long for now.